cost of going live is that we have such a good service that youtube is giving us that it stays there the whole video is available and i don't have to create storage <laughs> so <laughs> so thank you that or am i going to call you professor lim whatever whatever <laughs> no. you prefer no. So, no let me tell you i told you let me again repeat the whole idea behind the lecture series was which i put out also that ken cloak in that first episode of evolution of a mediator said that he attended a lecture about mediation and in 2 minutes flat he knew his life had changed so i said there's so many people out there who i want to bring into the fold I and mean, they will never have access so let's put these together first and then spread it so let's get a lot collection of these and like i told you it is not just one lecture by you the idea is that if like i was just telling you that you'll have your followers and you can take it as you like because like gunavati from malaysia she is of course she loves to come in she is doing her lecture so if her lecture she says i want to be very structured so i say okay you want to be structured you go structured someone else wants to take it as they want so they'll take it as they want so that's the idea behind it so just to inspire people yeah to take it forward and after that the whole what what do we call it in the in lectures your podium or whatever is yours mm-hmm. i am not there i'm i'm a student sitting at the back i've always yeah. i've always been a back bencher so i'm going to the back so it's yours professor thanks vikram um i thought what i'll do today is uh, uh deal with something that uh is not conceptual i thought i'll do something simple on a saturday morning here Uh, and I'll just tell stories. I thought, and I will tell three stories, three mediation stories, uh, stories that uh, involve uh, me personally in different capacities. And so I recognize that uh, if you're listening in, uh, I want to tell you it's great to have you. Uh, and if you listen to this in the future through the recording, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'm contactable. by linkedin uh happy to hear your thoughts uh on these stories the idea of these uh, my sharing these stories it's really not so much uh to tell listener um what you need to think but to invite you to come alongside with me and as i share with you uh my own thoughts uh in reflection um when i was going through uh these uh situations and to ask you to think along what you would do uh, if you were in the same situation so these are uh mediation uh cases that i think all of us would be familiar with so there's there's nothing special i've decided to pick cases where uh if you are a practitioner you would uh, find yourself nodding and and feeling like uh, it's a, a case that you can readily understand uh and the issues that i raise uh, or that are raised by the cases are also um issues that you i think would readily uh, appreciate as well so i i i i'm personally a visual learner uh and so i find that slides are helpful so i'm going to uh pull out slides just to help me along uh and to help us focus <clears throat> so <clears throat> if you can see uh three success stories today mediation success stories i put success in inverted comma and i invite you to think along uh what success actually means uh as we progress in each of these three stories so this three stories uh, on a saturday morning deal with my experience in mediation as first of all a disputant someone who's actually involved in the dispute as a party uh and then the second story involves um my uh acting as a lawyer representing a party uh as a mediation advocate uh in the mediation and last uh, as uh, my acting as a mediator as a neutral uh, in a mediation case so here's the first story and this story took place um well probably no more than um 10 years ago but it 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 was a case that uh troubled a lot of people during that time uh and I still am uh I'm I was part of a committee 
uh, in a residential estate. And uh, we uh, were all of about uh, 12 or 13 of us in this committee. And then there was a new owner who came in and very quickly uh, things went south between the relationship of the committee that I belong to and this new homeowner. And what resulted was uh, a dispute that escalated because I think of um, disagreements in, first of all, starting with what the new owner wanted to do in his uh, property, which as a committee, we felt that uh, he could not do uh, legally. Uh, and that led to massive disagreements, which escalated and which resulted in the owner deciding to circulate uh, allegations about my committee members and my conduct, which we just kind of felt was just over the top uh, and all untrue. And so there were all these communication that flowed in between uh, where the homeowner said that uh, these stories are true. Uh, and then he doubled down by publishing even more articles. Uh, and all this was going on for, you know, you can imagine a dispute where you don't have a, a closure and you get constant barrage of emails flowing to and fro. Uh, and after a while, you know, um, for those of us who uh, practice uh, in dispute resolution, you know what it's like when you receive an email from a, a lawyer that uh, you may not have a great relationship with, right? But, you know, it's really different when you are a party in, in the dispute itself and you receive an email that's very personally targeted against you. Uh, it is an experience which I find is useful for a lot of us who may be practicing as lawyers or as uh, neutral, as mediators or arbitrators, to from time to time remind yourself that when a party goes through a dispute, whether it's uh, personally or as a representative for a company, they experience a, a whole range and intensity of emotions, which are very different from you as either their representative, legal representative, or uh, a, as someone who's trying to help them resolve the dispute. So uh, I think the first takeaway would be never to underestimate uh, how difficult it is the moments that they're going through. So this case uh, went on for many months and there were even meetings, town hall meetings uh, that we held where he and his supporters would show up and they would literally yell at those of us who were in the committee. Um, and, and some of the things they yell uh, would easily be, you know, um, um, uh, things or, 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 or uh, words that you cannot repeat in a public forum, <laughs> right? So uh, this went on for some time and then the litigation started, right? My, myself with uh, three other committee members uh, felt that the line had been crossed some time ago. So we decided uh, to sue. And you know, when, when this was happening, I actually had many reflections uh, because I'm just thinking, on many different fronts, right? I'm thinking, well, look, you know, I shouldn't be all that troubled by this. I'm a practicing lawyer for a few decades by then. And also I pride myself also as a medi being a mediator, being able to dissect disputes and not to uh, be so personally troubled. Uh, but it is different, as I said earlier on, when you are personally involved in the dispute. And, and this is what I want to share with you, you see, and how this dispute uh, evolve also uh, allows me to appreciate um, much better uh, what goes through the mind uh, and the emotions of a disputant, a party that's involved. So we decided to sue. Uh, and and um, I go in with my eyes open, of course, because litigation in Singapore is extremely expensive. Uh, and I, being a lawyer in practice, was asked by my other three uh, committee members to pick the media, uh, to pick the uh, the lawyer and I picked someone who is very senior. Uh, in Singapore, we have senior counsel who are uh, lawyers who are the equivalent of Queen's counsel. So the, the cost was extremely high. 
So by the time we arrived at the doorstep of mediation, uh, the pleadings had already been closed and discovery had taken place. Uh, and we had put out an offer to settle of $200,000 uh, to be shared between the four of us with a cost of $60,000. For the uninitiated, this means that uh, in the process of litigation, the four of us as the claimants, as the plaintiff, had put out formally an offer saying that we were prepared to accept a settlement uh, if the defendant, the homeowner, agreed to pay us $200,000 with cost of $60,000. Uh, for what we say uh, are uh, publication of uh, defamatory materials uh, against us. Uh, it wasn't accepted, and so we went into mediation. And against this backdrop of going into mediation, uh, i got to tell you this, uh, that uh, when we arrived at mediation, by that time, I recall that uh, the homeowner defendant had uh, made also a complaint to the regulatory authority for lawyers in Singapore. So for me, it was another layer uh, of feeling yet another layer of, of feeling a grief that he had the gall to go and make this complaint uh, about uh, how I conducted a meeting, uh, a general meeting, a town hall meeting. And the complaint was that I, I had misled, I had been dishonest and had misled uh, members attending the meeting. <clears throat> and I mentioned earlier on that uh, even at the meeting, he had called us liars and other names. So by that time also, I had spent a lot of money on legal fees. <laughs> so going into the mediation, uh, I, I remember um, that thinking a lot about whether I was truly ready to settle a case at mediation with uh, someone like uh, this homeowner. And then at the mediation itself, just to give you a, a sense of... Um, what it was like for me. Uh, at, at all times, you know, sometimes you, you talk to a person that you dislike <laughs> and then that person uh, gives a smart look and a condescending smile each time we said something serious. And I, I remember feeling very troubled by that. Uh, more troubled than I thought I should be. But again, you know, it, it, it was a lot of learning for me on uh, being involved in a, a dispute, how you feel compared to a one layer outwards, you know, that you're either representing a party or two layer outwards if you're acting as a neutral. And then another point I didn't really like is lawyers. I felt as lawyers were very sanctimonious. Uh, they were uh, very condescending. Uh, they didn't appreciate uh, how uh, we, my committee members and I, felt about the conduct of uh, their clients. And then the last point may strike some of you as being a bit odd because I said that uh, my feelings, I remember, was that I felt the mediator was too neutral, uh, that was always trying to steer us towards compromise. And I remember as a, a party in this suit, at some point, you know, you, you kind of feel like you want someone alongside. You want someone to, to give you that sense of assurance, that to give you that empathy, you know, that uh, you, you know, those words spoken like, you know, the other side's clearly wrong and, you know, you, you have a right to feel this way. So the, the, as the mediation progressed, it sort of felt very sterile. I remember feeling like this is not what I bargained for, even though the, the mediator was a very experienced mediator. So it leads you to a, a question of, well, how did this case end? Uh, I, I can tell you the case didn't settle. Um, the offer placed by uh, the defendant during the mediation was pretty low. You remember I mentioned earlier that we had issued an offer to settle the case by him paying us 200000 for the four of us and legal costs of 60000 The amount I think he was willing to pay did not come up to even half of that sum. So the case didn't resolve itself, didn't settle at mediation. But it does uh, hark back to this question that we sometimes ask ourselves, right? What is success at mediation? What, what does uh, success in mediation mean to all of us? Uh, if you are a mediator, does success mean that you settle the case? Is that your definition of success? And what about the lawyers involved in the mediation? Is success to them setting the case or Sometimes lawyers will say success may be not settling the case so they get more fees going into litigation. I mean, I don't know. Uh, that would be a perverse way of, of, 
uh, characterizing success in mediation, right? Especially for lawyers who know what mediation is all about. Uh, and then what about the parties? What, what did success mean to the defendant? I wonder, I mean, like, did he actually feel like um, he was morally right, that he was holding the high ground, that um, he had uh, more to lose than us by settling? I don't know. I mean, th those are the kind of thoughts that run through my mind. And I'm sure that uh, a party that goes into mediation has many moments to think about those kinds of questions. So in reviewing this case, uh, these are the questions that I think would be pertinent, right? Like who are the parties seeking a successful outcome? What, what does success actually mean in mediation? I mean, we can conceptually talk about what success means, but you know, on the ground, uh, I was quite clear what success actually meant to me, and I'll share that with you in a bit. And uh, the, the parties achieve success in mediation. Does it mean that if you don't settle, it means you don't achieve success? Right. So what, what, what is my takeaway on this? As a disputant in this case, I felt that uh, the mediation was successful in that it reinforced um, my sense that the defendant had been unfair to the four of us, right? Uh, it was also successful in my mind that uh, in pursuing litigation, it reinforced in my mind that we were correct in, in taking this uh, homeowner into the courts uh, to get an outcome uh, because at the mediation, Again, his conduct reinforced in our minds why we felt that he had been very unfair to all of us. So, at the end, I think my takeaway uh, from this case is that on an overarching level for mediation practitioners, uh, there's a need, I think, for all of us to constantly remind ourselves, I think no matter whether you've been in practice as a mediator or a mediation advocate, a lawyer, for one year or 20, 30 years. Take time out, I think, to remember that when parties are there with a dispute, uh, especially in the mediation process, uh, respect the party autonomy. We teach this, right, in mediation, where you say, after you have generated the best options for resolution, uh, you compare that with the best alternative, right? Um, the Batner test, right? And if the best alternative is superior to what's the best option on the table, then wouldn't it make sense for that party to reject the settlement offer on the table and accept the alternative? I mean, in this case, this was what happened. I felt that the best option on the table came nowhere near to the best alternative, which was to continue pursuing the litigation. And that's what we did. The second point being not to assume that you know what a party wants out of mediation. I think sometimes um, maybe a lot of us who have been in practice for a long time, right? And who have day in, day out, you know, every week you do a, a couple of mediation cases, you think that you actually know. Uh, and here's a reminder that sometimes you don't. And don't assume that you know what people want out of the mediation. And then the, the, the last point I think is, is something that is a very useful reminder, no matter how long you've been in practice. Sometimes I think as mediators, uh, we get into uh, this habit of thinking it's all about getting a settlement. Uh, and I want to, uh, I think maybe just share and remind all of us, myself included, of course, that it's really not sometimes about just getting that settlement for the parties. Right, uh, it may look good to your CV to have a, another notch, feather in the cap, uh, but that may not be the best outcome for the parties. Let's be very careful about this. I mean, in the last uh, two years, I've had the unfortunate uh, situation of having been engaged by the client for two cases, these are commercial cases, where they had entered into a mediated settlement agreement somewhat at the encouragement, if you would like, uh, some may call it coercion of the mediator. 
And after that, they felt just that it wasn't right. Uh, and maybe but for the mediator's encouragement, they would not have resolved it that way, but would have gone on to do other things to resolve their dispute. So I think the point three here uh, is a good reminder for us not to get too arrogant about um, what we always perceive as a good outcome for the parties. We don't know enough out there in the dispute to be um, putting things or, or pushing people towards getting a settlement. I mean, we, to those of us who've been in practice a long time, you know, we know how to do this without it being looking like coercion. But I think be very careful when you are aging the party towards a settlement because it may not be uh, the best outcome for them. Uh, in, in my case, uh, eventually, just to sort of put an ending to it, uh, we went back uh, to huddle with the, our lawyers after the mediation did not achieve a settlement. And we were all ready you know, to go to court uh, because we really felt that that would be the best forum for us to achieve vindication. And if you like, uh, there was also a sense within a lot of us that uh, that kind of outcome would be best for us because we could then... Uh, clear our names and restore our reputation, right? Uh, and then, you know, in a, in a sort of unfortunate way, unfortunate in inverted comma, we had an offer to settle out there, right? Uh, which under our rules of court, uh, if you wanted to withdraw that, that offer to settle, you needed to um, put out a written notice to withdraw. But before we could do that, the defendant accepted the offer to settle. And, you know, you might think, well, then you should be happy, right? Because the matter is resolved. I will tell you this, as a disputant, when the offer to settle was accepted after the mediation, which didn't result in a settlement, there was this strong disappointment, you know? Uh, and, and I think those of us who have been in disputes will understand what I'm saying. The disappointment that we didn't get to go to court for this case, right? And the disappointment that the defendant actually accepted the offer to settle. Uh, and we lost the opportunity to hold him accountable in an adversarial process. So such an interesting uh, outcome for me uh, that as a mediation practitioner, I, I could say this, but I will tell you that uh, these are uh, real, real feelings um, that came to me uh, in this first story. So I want to settle down a little bit now and move on to a second story. Uh, didn't involve me personally now. The second story is about my role as a lawyer. Uh, my practice um, involves, um, I, I, I think probably I could say 70, 80% litigation or arbitration, the adversarial processes. But in much of uh, what I do in that 70 or 80% cases, at some point, uh, we usually invite parties to go into mediation, right? Very, very few cases uh, in that remaining 10-20% uh, involve mediation without uh, an adversarial process running alongside. The parties to the litigation in this case uh, were a company. Uh, I acted for uh, individual parties. There were three of them, and they were the uh, previous shareholders and directors of the company. They had sold off their shares in the company and were quite happily looking forward to starting, uh, moving on, starting a new setup. But the company um, somehow after having bought over their uh, business, um, the new shareholders came on board and decided that uh, they were, um, they decided that they had a case against my clients, the three of them or breaches of various duties. So my clients were very really unhappy with this because I think they felt that uh, maybe there was a, a, a biased remorse by the new shareholders and they were doing their best to make life difficult for the three of them. So I represented them uh, and this matter went on in court and the defendants uh, had told me that they were very prepared to take this matter to trial. Right. Um, all litigation lawyers, I think, know that uh, trial, at least in the common law world, at least in my world, 
uh, trial is where the, the, the litigation or dispute resolution lawyer uh, makes the most fees, right? This is an open fact. I'm not saying anything novel. Uh, and so when you have a client that is able to afford those fees, uh, th this is uh, like the perfect kind of case uh, for a dispute resolution lawyer. But my practice is such that I always encourage people to go into mediation, right? It is part and parcel of my psyche and I believe in mediation. So we went into mediation. And just like um, the, the first situation um, where I was there as a disputant, we went into mediation with a mediator who was a personal friend of mine, someone I know well. Uh, and at the mediation, after having gone through the joint session at a private caucus where we were exchanging offers, the offer by the plaintiff was not good enough to accept outright, but also not bad enough to reject outright. You know that kind of feeling where it's neither here nor there, right? And as a lawyer acting for the defendant, this is a kind of scenario where uh, my default often would be to say, look, you know, if you do accept um, an offer, an offer, you know, to close a case, an outcome that you can live with, uh, it's actually better than taking the risk and spending money and time going into litigation. I mean, that's really the right thing to, to do and, and to think and to say. Uh, but here's a case where I felt very strongly that uh, the plaintiffs were acting in bad faith right from the start. Uh, and my clients were, in a sense, innocent victims. I did not believe that there was any basis for the plaintiffs to have taken them to court at all. I mean, all the instances or details of the alleged breaches, I, I felt were just uh, uh, particulars which, or details which could not be proven. They, they were exaggerated. Uh, examples at, at best. But the mediator kept urging my client uh, and myself, can you imagine, to be reasonable with our expectations? And I remember one um, uh, side meeting that the mediator put me out and, and almost castigated me to say, you know, you have to be more supportive of the mediation process. And, and I remember thinking my, myself, how dare you tell me that, you know? Uh, don't you know that we came through this process together? And we had gone through, I mean, this mediator and I, we, we had uh, done co-trainings together. We had um, been trainers as well uh, in um, mediation training. And I'm thinking to myself, uh, how can you say that to me right? uh, when I'm trying to do my best for the client? So how did this case end? Uh, well, it ended with a settlement. Uh, it ended with a settlement because at the end, I encouraged the defendants to think about uh, how they would like to move on and set up their new venture. And with all this case overhanging, it would be a source of distraction. It wasn't about the money because my clients were, as I mentioned earlier, they had sold their shares. So they were flush with uh, funds. They could easily afford the litigation. Uh, and to some extent, um, the case wasn't a difficult one. So I didn't think that they would need to commit a lot of time. But I, I felt that um, it was my duty uh, and they deserve to know that, you know, when you get into litigation, you actually lose control, right? Uh, ultimately, the lawyers run the case for you. Uh, we present the legal theory. We do the examination, cross-exam. We conduct the case in court and ultimately, the judge decides who wins, who loses. Uh, wouldn't it be better for them to not have to deal with all those uncertainties uh, and instead to move on towards their new endeavors, which is what they agreed at the end. They, they agreed that that was good advice, that they would accept the settlement offer, even though it wasn't great. But I, I've got to tell you this, that you know when I look at this case again, remembering how it went, and asking myself, what is um, success in mediation? Uh, it depends on how you define it. I mean, uh, if, if you look at uh, a traditional definition of how we sometimes, you know, you read books, mediation books and negotiation books, you talk about, again, the weighing your options and your alternative. Uh, in a theoretical fashion, this would be a successful outcome, right? The clients didn't have to expend more money and and didn't have to expend uh, more time on the case. 
But I couldn't help feeling there was something missing in this settlement. <clears throat> uh, I felt, again, disappointed, actually, that the client didn't achieve that sense of justice, I felt. Uh, it was a kind of watered-down feeling. <clears throat> um, I wish they had got more out of the process. Um, but it was, at the end, <clears throat> a settlement, and they could move on. <clears throat> I wonder sometimes whether the alternative uh, ending would have been more satisfying or was that just my wishful thinking as a lawyer, as a mediation advocate, um, that maybe if they had gone to court, the sense of vindication uh, would have provided them a higher level of satisfaction. Um, is that important in, in uh, the final analysis? It's very hard to say. Uh, here, I'm acting as a lawyer, so... Uh, I'm one step removed from the parties. Um, you know, questions like this are often best answered uh, with the percept when you have perception of uh, hindsight, right? Uh, when you look back, you know, 2020 vision, then you can answer that question properly. But at the moment, I remember when the matter was settled, I just kind of felt like um, the client deserved more, um, but it wasn't my call. And as a lawyer, uh, I had some regrets and disappointment that it ended this way. Uh, but uh, I think some would say that a, uh, an outcome in mediation that results in the settlement is always better than the risk uh, and the efforts, time, money that you need to spend pursuing one uh, in litigation. But I, I throw that out to everyone out there to think about is that always true? You know? uh, the alternative ending of um, not settling, bringing this to court, and then maybe getting a better outcome in court uh, always features, um, I'm not so sure it's as, as black and white as sometimes um, as mediators uh, we make it out to be. Again, back to this three questions, right? Uh, as a mediation advocate respecting party autonomy, I respected the party, what they wanted to decide. I, I can't assume that I know what they want out of the mediation. And uh, I, you know, it's not always about getting a settlement. And, and this, I, I say also with, with a lot of respect for the mediator that uh, he was obviously trying his best to get a settlement. But maybe sometimes when we as mediators are looking so hard to try and get the deal together, we sometimes maybe try a bit too hard, I find. Uh, consequently, uh, you miss sometimes the forest for the trees, right? That you miss uh, the, the signals by the parties about what's really important to them. So this is a, a useful reminder of, of, of that, to, to not assume in the cases that we're involved in as mediation counsel, as, as uh, mediators, uh, to be in that moment, you know, to, to spend enough time uh, not with your own roadmap and trying to reach that end point, but to let the case unfold and peel off the layers bit by bit. Uh, and to always be ready to uh, hand over uh, to what the parties believe is uh, ultimately in their best interest. So my third story for today uh, is where I was acting as a mediator. Uh, this is a, a, a story that probably happened close to maybe about seven years now, six, seven years ago. And I remember telling this story um, in the a mediation competition in Paris uh, because it was one of those cases that didn't result in a settlement. And I have often wondered, like, um, could I or my co-mediators have, co have, have done more? for the parties, or was it as, as good as we could do in the circumstances of this case? So this uh, names have been changed, of course, uh, is a story involving uh, a lady, a uh, pretty elderly lady uh, who was not well. Uh, and this, uh, this was her, her background, right? In the 1980s, she developed an illness in the 1990s, she had a medical procedure. And then there was a new protocol that kicked in 2009 in the hospitals 
uh, which resulted in her discovering uh, something that was quite devastating for her. And then in 2011, legal action was commenced and then the mediation I was referring to took place in 2017. Wow, that's um, not so long ago, right? Four or five years ago. Uh, so not so long as I imagined, but it seemed like a long time ago. So this legal action, you, 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 you note, uh, 2011, is already uh, way past uh, the typical six years or 15 years long stop date of most of our limitation act, our statute of limitation. And that's one of the difficulties with this case presented to her by her lawyers. So Rose and Paul, Paul being her husband, uh, were the parties that uh, showed up in the mediation as the claimant. And they were represented by Oliver, uh, who's a lawyer acting for them. Again, Oliver is someone I know really well because he was in this, we went through law school together. So he's a very experienced uh, counsel. Uh, and then you have um, the defendants in the litigation, which comprised the doctor who attended to her, as well as the hospital itself. And they were represented by two lawyers, one acting for the hospital and the staff and the other acting for the doctor himself. So I'll just name them. Of course, these are not their real names. Um, Sophia acting for Dr. Sim, who's the doctor who attended to her. Uh, the hospital who was uh, a caregiver during the time she received her medical procedure. And Pamela, who was counsel acting for the hospital. So this was the day that um, we arrived in the mediation. And the mediators, there are two of us, myself as a lawyer and uh, a doctor, a very senior practitioner uh, who co-mediated the case with me. In medical mediations in Singapore, uh, usually uh, the institutions like to have two, have it co-mediated so that you have the benefit of a lawyer as well as a, a doctor who's co-mediating. And then during the joint session, um, we invited parties to speak. This was obviously a very difficult case. Uh, difficult, the difficulty was partly because by this time, uh, as I will explain later, uh, Rose had developed uh, stage three colon cancer uh, and the prognosis didn't look very good. She arrived in a wheelchair. Uh, Oliver, who acted for uh, Rose, came, you know, to the mediation really um, with the degree of intensity, you know, wanting to put her client's case forward. And when the other lawyers acting for the doctor and the hospital said, well, look, you know, the case is time barred, statute of limitation, he said, well, uh, there is no time bar in criminal proceedings. So if we don't get a resolution, we will pursue criminal proceedings against the doctor and whoever's responsible. Uh, Pamela, who acts for, I think I mentioned Pamela acting for um, the hospital, right? Mentioned about Dr. Sim and the hospital's commitment to help. Uh, so the right language was put by lawyers acting for the hospital and uh, the doctor. By the way, Pamela is not the, the lawyer's real name. She's really uh, a very experienced lawyer. And I, I've had um, many dealings with her. And she's one of those lawyers who... Um, Although she's not a mediator, uh, she has a lovely personality and a very apt, uh, conducts herself as a mediation advocate very, very well. Uh, Paul talked about uh, how when Rose was in hospital uh, undergoing the procedure and having um, experienced uh, what was an unfortunate incident of the hospital and the surgeon not treating her properly and leaving actually a, a tool in her at the end of the, the, the procedure, had the goal to charge her a bill to remove uh, what was left in her. Uh, and then you had Dr. Sin coming on board to express his remorse to say that, but he's, you know, he's really done his best and this was an unfortunate uh, incident. So when we went into the private caucus, um, uh, Oliver, who acts for the for Rose, was, you know, livid that 
he still hasn't heard an expression uh, of acknowledgement of the mistakes made by the doctor in the hospital. Uh, and then Paul, who is a husband, um, said that, look, you know, because of this, Rose had developed stage three colon cancer. This is, is extremely difficult. I think at that stage, um, you see at the mediator, I, I mentioned three dots because I think both my co-mediator and I were struggling uh, to, to see how best we could develop, to, to could continue this mediation where um, clearly there was a, a, a challenge just getting the parties to speak openly. Part of, I think a part of the difficulty is, is that with the hospital and the doctor, there's always this reticence uh, of being of acknowledging wrong, right? Of apologizing because uh, partly because I think the insurers were also involved, right? And in, in part of the insurance uh, policy or the requirement is that the parties do not openly acknowledge or at least uh, too willingly acknowledge uh, wrongdoing. So Oliver also mentioned that there must be a reasonable amount of settlement went into the private caucus with the hospital and, and the doctor as well as their lawyers. And of course, they mentioned time bar, right? They said, look, uh, it is one of the things that uh, is going to be a challenge to Rose if she pursues or continues with the litigation case. And also mentioned about the waiver of the hospital fees. Dr. Sim, I kind of remember him and I felt for him because he was really trying his best uh, to, to express his, you know, his, um, his emotions of what had gone wrong. Um, but he really seemed to have felt that he's done his best. Uh, but you know, mistakes happen. Um, and what could he do? He could not go back in time to uh, unravel those mistakes, right? Um, I remember this case went on in private caucus and we were doing shuttle diplomacy for a bit, but eventually uh, we reached a point where uh, uh, the offers were just inadequate for Rose and her lawyer felt that um, while they had had a good discussion at the mediation, the offers were inadequate, so they, they didn't settle that day, but they did agree to uh, timelines being exchanged uh, for further conduct of the litigation, and they also agreed to consider further mediation. So I, I, I remember that towards the end when we were having the final plenary before um, saying bye to, to all the parties. Uh, I remember looking at um, Rose and, and her husband, and I remember that um, there was this sense of sadness, like, I think that you can see from the expression, but also you felt, I felt that they had been given an, an opportunity to speak their mind. And so uh, it was, the, the anger was gone by that time, uh, but replaced by uh, this, maybe sense of sadness, but also uh, the, the, a reticent look of feeling at least satisfied that they've had, they've been able to say what they want to say. So it does bring me to this point where I look at this case and ask who and what, who are the parties who are seeking a successful outcome and what, what does actually success mean in, in this particular case? Did the parties actually achieve success? And if you look at the parties, the, the, uh, or all the stakeholders here, right? How do each of the parties measure success? I mean, as mediators, myself and, and uh, my co-mediator, I mean, we, of course, were trying to measure success by uh, a settlement, right? We look to see if we can facilitate a dialogue. Uh, we look to see whether when parties have expressed uh, what they want to say, their emotions, we see whether or not we can go into a, uh, an options generation stage, see whether we can find areas where parties are willing to give and take, find a compromise outcome, right? So that's our measure. What about the lawyers? I mean, you think about it. I mean, clearly the lawyers acting for the hospital and the doctor, they were trying to find a settlement. They wanted this case to go away. But I, I think when I look at what the measure of success is for Rose, uh, lawyers acting for Rose. Um, Oliver, I think, was there to make the point that as a hospital and doctor, you have failed Rose. And this is not just a case where you can just come to mediation, expect money to resolve things. 
right? There has to be a deeper expression of remorse, uh, of accountability. I think he wanted all of that, which he didn't achieve that day uh, in the mediation. And then if we move away from the lawyers, what about the, the parties? I mean, did I think that they achieved success? What, what were they looking for when they came into the mediation? What did success look like for them in the mediation? Was it a settlement? Or was it something other than a settlement? I, I suppose for the hospital and Dr. Sim, probably it would be a settlement, right? That uh, they could close the case off and no longer be troubled by the uh, impending litigation. Um, but again, for Rose and her husband, no matter what they got out of this, uh, life goes on, right? And Rose has her medical issues to deal with. So what does success mean for, for the two of them? Uh, I don't think that um, there are easy answers to any of um, these questions. Uh, again, it really goes back to uh, something which is outlined by uh, Chris Moore in his book uh, about what satisfactory outcomes in mediation sometimes look like. Right? And he talks about uh, a process satisfaction, outcome satisfaction, and psychological satisfaction that these are three elements sometimes which matters to parties. Um, he suggested that uh, if a party goes into mediation and at least accomplishes two out of three, that they would be reasonably satisfied enough to be willing to participate in mediation in the future. Uh, I think clearly for this case, uh, maybe for Rose and her husband, there was a degree of psychological satisfaction. I'm not sure that um, they were they had any satisfactory outcome. Uh, clearly, they didn't, weren't willing to accept uh, the proposals made by the hospital and Dr. Sim. And did they feel that they had uh, process satisfaction? Um, I would like to have thought so, but I suppose um, it's harder sitting as a neutral and trying to evaluate yourself. Uh, but it, it does look like uh, at the end, uh, they were at least reasonably satisfied with process and psychological satisfaction. So my learning uh, an alternative ending for this case, um, I wonder if um, they had gone further. I, in fact, uh, I remember having written that piece uh, for uh, Stories Mediators Tell, uh, the uh, ABA book. I, I, I went back to, to see whether parties had resolved their differences, but uh, I couldn't uh, find uh, an, an ending uh, in the case at that point in time yet. But it, it goes back again to, I think, um, the recurring theme for today's sharing, right? I, I mentioned again that as mediation practitioners, uh, always to respect uh, the party's autonomy, not to assume that we know what they want out of mediation. And it's, all, it's not always about uh, getting a settlement. Uh, and so reminding all of us in mediation that as much as this is... Uh, a, a glorious time to be a mediator, to be involved in mediation, uh, that there are many other ways, uh, processes of dispute resolution, right? Um, and that mediation is not necessarily the panacea uh, for all disputes that appear before a mediator. I mean, if the bear is a mediator, he may have a different outcome that he thinks is suitable for the parties, right? Uh, and uh, I think that um, you know we hold true to trying to find help parties find a, a good outcome in mediation, but let's not lose sight of um, our role in mediation. Uh, that we are not there to steer parties towards a settlement, no matter what. So this is uh, where I, I want to stop and not belabor the point. Um, I, I want to thank all of you for, for uh, joining me in today's sharing. I thought I'll just keep it simple to three stories. I'm happy to hear your thoughts if anyone has any thoughts. Uh, and uh, I hand this back to you, Vikram. Pat, thank you very much, obviously. As expected, there was a post by your Maxwell Chambers. I just wrote there, as expected, that lecture is excellent. But one thing that you have to do is in the next whatever little time that you want to spend on this. Here we're targeting people who actually have nothing to do with mediation maybe today, but they have that mediator mindset. They're just out there somewhere. 
we'll get to there. The lecture will get to them somehow. I'll get it there. However, I have to do it. I'll get it there. So just something to inspire them to take up mediation as a profession. And after that, I'll introduce you to Elizabeth because I have called her specially for your next session on the experiences part. So I'll do that. So something that you want to tell us about how inspiring them about how to. Oh, I see. You're that, not yeah. asking me. I thought you were going to ask Elizabeth. No, no, no. The her, I'll get in. Of course, I'm telling you specifically for that session. I've called her. I'll tell you about her then. So, okay. Um, I I think if um to those of us who are just starting out uh and um are coming on stream doing starting to do mediations either as a mediator or or um being a lawyer involved in the mediation process um uh. A few things, I suppose, um, from my own experience, um, it's to treat each case uh, as a very special one. Um, that when you have the privilege of coming into a case as a mediator or as a party help, as a lawyer helping a party in the mediation, um, don't shortchange yourself and the parties. You know, it it doesn't have always to be a big case. Some of us get to a point where you look forward to the big cases and then. Uh, you know, you go out there, you, you want to be able to say, oh, you know, your last case was a dispute involving 100 million. Why is that important? Uh, every case is important to the parties who want their dispute resolved. That's something that's really worth reminding ourselves. I, I, I think that the difficulty now that mediation has become so on stream in dispute resolution uh, and with all the, 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 the hype uh, with the, generated by the Singapore Convention, uh, generated by the new working group three on um, investor state uh, dispute uh, resolution through mediation. I think we, we, it's timely sometimes we remind ourselves that the genesis of mediation has always been to allow parties to find their own outcomes uh, in all sorts of cases with the help of a, a neutral. And I think that if you're starting out, uh, just remind yourself the good that you can do uh, with each case. It uh, doesn't matter whether it's a big case or a small case. But that what I will do is maybe for the next lecture, I'm going to take you even backwards. Now, this is one person sitting in some small town in some corner of the world and has the mindset is maybe doing mediation. I'm saying maybe it might be in school and doing it there and we want this person to take it up as a profession so we have to reach there and in that language where how and yeah. what it should inspire them something on that maybe next lecture i'm okay with that okay that's all great yeah, yeah. so now elizabeth but i don't even know she writes elizabeth sometimes elizabeth sometimes yes what is it going to be elizabeth or elizabeth Vikram, as you wish. In Russia, I am I am Elizaveta, but if it's more comfortable for you, you may call me Elizabeth. Translation <laughs> is Elizabeth. Okay, first of all, you have to say hello to Professor Lim. You've come to a lecture, you have to greet him properly. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the lecture. I started watching on YouTube and later I came to Zoom. Uh, uh, thank you so much. It's interesting for me. And uh, do you know? Now in our region, in Russia, in Altai territory, we created association of mediators and uh, here a lot of uh, mediators which uh, only start uh, working in this uh, profession. And uh, the question about what is success for mediator is really important because uh, many of us always think that we must uh, uh, write settlement and uh, that uh, if... Uh, parties uh, don't get settlements, so the mediation is uh, unsuc unsuccess. Mm -hmm. So uh, I like your point of view, and I want to share it with uh, our colleagues, because I think it will be um, much wider for them uh, to understand that uh, uh, some uh, another uh, parts of work of mediator are uh, useful, and not only if uh, we we write some documents at the end. Thank you. That's that's really encouraging. And, and I want to further encourage you that um, I think there's enough uh, data out there that shows even if uh, parties don't settle the case at the mediation itself, 
um, by virtue of what's been exchanged during the mediation, they are likely to have a good chance at settling after the mediation has concluded. But right. that helping also tell you that she's in a small town in Russia called Barnol, which is really small in that sense. For, for Singapore, small is different. For India, small is very different. <laughs> so, so, so in that sense, and there she has very good thoughts. She was in the symposium. And of course, I mean, you would, might not get time to watch all the sessions there. But the thoughts that she has, excellent. Now, only thing is creating opportunities because obviously, the, the not. I mean, I still find it surprising that a lot of work is happening in Barnol, a small town, but there is activity and they have these associations and everything. So I think they're doing excellent work. But to actually talk to them about opportunities, which I will want you to do in the next session on mm -hmm. the ex experiences part, because I really feel that people like her. This is like I, on uh, with uh, when I did this with Adi yesterday. I had someone mm -hmm. from Argentina. So really nice thoughts she wants to do about she, she looks she, she was working in the she's working in the government she's taken one year unpaid leave because wow. she wants to follow this passion yes. opportunities you can understand what the situation my challenge is that she should not go back now she, she, ten months are left she should not go back so I saw this I said I sent her the jams thing get the look happens doesn't happen that's a separate thing but at least that discussion with people mm. like you to understand what are the opportunities and to connect with you. So that is what I did with her with Adi yesterday. Same thing with Elizabeth. We will look at that in the next session. So, sure. so anything else you want to tell those people out there who have it in them, but still can't look at it as a profession because of the issues that we have as the way. It's I, I think that if it's a passion, a life passion, um, it wouldn't really matter very much to you because every morning when you wake up, uh, you would find new energy, renewed energy to continue doing that, right? And it's, it's like any passion in life, I think, when you pluck in hard enough and long enough, uh, and it really represents a deep-seated desire, uh, you finally achieve success. Uh, again, the measure of success being what we make it out to be, right? Uh, and so charting your own journey and one of the expressions I sometimes use, finding your place under the sun is really important where you can make a difference to, you know, the next person who comes to you for help. I, I think that's really uh, our goal in life. But look, I, my target is that those people who are passionate about it should take it as, up as a full-time profession which is not really mm -hmm. happening anywhere in the world i mean very few people out there who are taking it up so that is what we have to target we we'll move, move i mean whatever way i could i'm doing my little bit and i want to get people involved who do that but first i want to take you through what's happening in november i've started doing this earlier i wasn't doing that but i realized that linkedin and facebook have this algorithm they don't show it to everyone all those posts they decide whom they want to show it to so let's start putting it out at least people will see and of course we have to start with this my <laughs> woodstock of <laughs> mediation i like that of course all the recordings are available and the index is on mediatorvikram.com then the, the if this series what is the inspiration behind the series mm -hmm. and the, that that uh, particular episode is also available on the channel yeah then we have of course this was, it was supposed to be Wednesday, it's now Saturday. Of course, now it's done. So, Katarzyna is coming later in the evening. She's from Poland. She's also a Jams fellow. Mm. She was she was in the same uh, thing with cohort as uh, Adi. Mm. So, she's coming in conversation with the beautiful mind. Her recording of that we'll do later about the Jams thing. Then we have this on the last day of every month, celebrating the birthdays of that month. Right. So, this is happening on 31st. At seventh, it's going to be right now. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to be seven thirty every month. Every month, I, right now, I'm keeping it as that, but it can be checked. But let's keep it at seven thirty. Then we have lecture by Michael Lang, wonderful person. I don't know whether you've heard him. That, I mean, really, I mean, you can beautiful soul kind of situation, which of course you all are also. And then we have that person I was talking about yesterday, who I had from Argentina. Very good thoughts into what she's looking at because she was part of the government to see how that basic dignity of the citizen, how that is affected by the entire system that they have to deal with and how can we bring in 
she says okay for mediation or dialogues or whatever might be which is what ken cloak has also spoken about his 10 points of what his role of mediators is so i really found that not just a local small town in argentina but relevant everywhere so this is something which i felt that if she puts it across properly and so as a jams fellow i mean that opportunity according to me is there so the discussion with adi was very nice mm. and we we'll take her forward then we have lecture mr kesani as a senior mediator from nigeria mm. and then we have bernie mais is is supposed to be mayor actually is it is some bernie mais right okay meet check yeah check that so he is of course very senior mediator and i mean I, i haven't really interacted with him which i first thing i'm going to do on the on the second but i've heard him and i really find him as a very nice person then gunavati from malaysia her students were there i scared them off i said put on your video you can't be invisible in a lecture so they ran off <laughs> and then we had this book thing i've started this talking books so we had one session with him where of course this is not correct this 23rd october is not correct this is happening on november but the point idea was that we talk about the book with the person and in this reflective practice thing that he's doing is very interesting he's got these groups all over the world and they talk about their experiences so this is happening in okay so you am this he's given a special discount mm. people can buy the book <laughs> okay <laughs> i don't get anything out of it i don't man monetize anything tight please <laughs> i'm putting that across here <laughs> <laughs> this is for people kathy water very interesting i mean really interesting her she was also part of the symposium you have to hear her thoughts on how, how getting art into mediation she is talking about that and then we have rafael who's the one who made that poster mm. on that so that's what we have and then we'll have the last day of uh, we'll have andrea she is also part of and uh, michael's group also reflective mm-hmm. practice and then we have the last day of the month we have the same thing celebrating mediators awesome. so that is why i have put it across because i'm telling you people don't end up looking at posts and all it doesn't happen and people ask me last minute what where's the link also i put the link out on the groups also so i'm having a tough time there <laughs> people don't listen to what i do so that any final things you want to tell us and then we'll close the session we'll start that session no it's it's been a pleasure as always and lovely to see you elizabeth keep and in touch so we we'll we're taking up in the next session okay so which is part of the next session perfect okay. thanks a lot kitat and Thank always you. nice that you accept my invitation for these things i'm really really happy about that